Oh, yeah, come on, come on. You knew we had to do this one eventually. This shit just gives me life. I don't know what it was about this rewatch, but it, it, this this channel is just Balgeet Appreciation Hour all day, every fucking day. I love this character so much. This episode gives me life in ways that I can't even begin to state. The appeal of this episode is pretty obvious. This is not the first time or even necessarily the most important time this relationship has been explored, but it is codifying to a degree. If you didn't already know, Bell Sheep was a character that was added in pretty much right after Disney picked up the series. He wasn't in the original pitch, he probably wasn't even really in the back of their minds when they were selling the show in the first place. He was added on suggestion. You know, they, they wanted to add some color to the cast, but also to try and add characters that would interact with Phineas and Ferb that have different perspectives on their milieu and shit. And most of the time they achieved this in ways that made him decidedly, like, inferior in the hierarchy. Though upon rewatch, what I also came to realize is that he had a very, very slight edge in the beginning, too. It's just, you had to tie it back into all that stereotypical shit. And so, if a raging bull stood in the way of him getting a good grade or not, he was probably gonna take the bull down. You know what I mean? There's some scant examples of this early on, but they are there. <laughs> that is right! It sparks my opponents! Sir! Do you smell something burning? An unconventional way to use my head, yes, but an effective one! I think it's easy to see why many would consider this to be the apex of that arc, but it was foreshadowed pretty early on. Like in all those time skip joints, he was wheeling and dealing. His portrayal early on was definitely problematic. Like he could have done all those things without being a blatant stereotype. And I do find it interesting that all of those elements kind of blended together, and we didn't even really notice it until the second half. The catalyst for this one is actually the inverse of the one presented in Hip Hip Parade, wherein it was necessary for Buford to break from their alignment for an insignificant reason. It's serendipitous that he went first, because it hammers home Balsheet's evolution that much more. That one came out way before the start of what most would consider to be the beginning of Balsheet's redemption arc. But even back then, he was he was kind of thriving. Buford was the one that struggled to move on with his life without him. Yet this is only one dynamic that dramatically shifts in this episode. Obviously, the former gaining confidence and taking on new skills and experiences is shifting the main dynamic between these two characters. But what people often don't address is that it also shifts the grouping of the entire quintet. In a metatextual sense, it is Phineas and Ferb's job to shepherd this nerd around and teach him about summer vacation and what it really means. Here, it is the follower who is leading the others, the student that has become the master. Over the course of one episode, Balshi became the most aspirational figure of this entire outfit. Just the thought of him having this new level of freedom or agency fueled him enough that he could climb a friggin' mountain, dragging his friends behind him. Keep in mind, this isn't even just like the peak of his confidence. This is not something he sees as the apex of his own development. He just wanted to try it, and he was only relying on himself to get there. He just kind of shoehorned it into the daily activity, because, you know, I mean, it was convenient. Like, while we're here, you know, not much else changed in the long run. It's important to note as well that while there is a significant change made to the quintet here, it lasts for this episode and presumably nowhere else. Though to be honest, the prospect of Balji just taking over the show for an episode, really interesting, I would love to see that. I guess they have time to do it now. They better take the hint. They gave this dynamic layers that you didn't even expect. Like, when both of them realized that they, they didn't have each other anymore, they had different reactions to it fundamentally. After they got up to the top of the mountain, Baljeet finally has time to let reality sink in. He's crestfallen. When he put two and two together, he was actually like, yeah, this is... This is kind of a bad arrangement here. Buford didn't figure shit out. He was he was told, you know, you have a new life now. This is just our new milieu, buddy. It's just you and me. And he was contemplative, he was quiet, he was he was thinking through everything. You would probably expect the reverse to be true, but these reactions aren't necessarily untrue to their dynamic or their individual personalities. I kind of mentioned it before, but <laughs> we, we gotta talk about this one specific shot here. The focus is on Phineas having a fucking mental breakdown because he was not allowed to use the wrench or the blowtorch or the peanut butter. 
when they did something kind of clever here, the sequence in which everybody's climbing up the mountain is organized from most willing to do it to least. Obviously, you have Baljeet in the lead. This is his mission. He's going to do it either way. Isabella's right behind him. She's been supportive the entire ride. And I'm emphasizing this right now because their dynamic is like, ugh. I don't even really know how this works. But I know she got into the habit of needling him later on for no fucking reason. Possibly to shut down a love triangle that nobody talks about. But either way, she was supporting him the entire time. She was she was his ride or die. And I just I just really appreciated seeing that on screen. It would have been very easy for her to try and course correct for Phineas' sake. She didn't give a fuck. She didn't care. The friendship solidarity is peak. She has not made any moves to stop, and I love her for that. This is this is peak content. Ferb is right behind her, who probably didn't prefer to do this, but he's not losing his fucking mind yet. And obviously behind him, you know, <laughs> you already know. You have to understand, when this episode came out, this was kind of a game-breaking cutscene. This man has no emotions other than content, or sing-song, or angry at sibling. So seeing this in real time, this was, this was like revolutionary. There was no other way to handle this other than shock and awe. Buford's piece consistently goes understated when discussions of this episode takes place. And I can't gush about it in the same capacity I could the other half. But I will say that this is probably like a validating experience for him. You got to see him shift from like a, a very straight and narrow bully character all the way into this eccentric mess that we know and love today. Tell me again, why you have a life-size mold of Candace? I got life-size molds of all my friends. But we don't really get to see the in-between. Like, you see him transition in real time, but you don't really know what that entails. You don't know the backstory behind it. You don't really know how the other three kids may have factored into this. I have to imagine after so long of not doing, like, real bully shit, it was gratifying for him to have his broader skills appreciated by someone who could actually use them. And I imagine, had this been like a permanent change, he probably would have been good for Doof to be around anyway. Someone who can be just as eccentric, more cultured, but also someone more decisive in his life to make real decisions. I think I think if this were hyped up as like a, a seasonal arc, they could have taken over the tri-state area by the end. It has the bully and the bullied. It has the bromance and the breakup. It has the best of both worlds. Out of 104 days, bully bromance breakup is the perfect encapsulation of why these two will remain frenemies to the end.